and mediation efforts. We have a stellar panel and a great moderator. So without further ado, I'm handing the mic over to my co-host, Mr. Tarja Lord Larson, president of the IPI. Thank you very much for those words, uh, Ambassador. And uh, it is a great, a great pleasure and honor for me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, their friends, to welcome you to this extremely timely online discussion on the topic, how the coronavirus pandemic affects conflict dynamics and mediation, new challenges to peace and security. Let me start by saying that, that the 2020 outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic has led bare the vulnerability of the international system to pandemic disease as a threat both to public health and the global economy. However, up till now, much of the international attention has been, and rightly so, focused on the health dimension of the virus. In addition to efforts to accelerate production and access to, uh, to diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines to prevent further spread of the virus and thereby saving lives. But much is still unknown about this virus and its impact. The impact is being felt far beyond global public health and in the financial, humanitarian and security sectors. As time moves on, the economic and security ripple effects will be profound. People's lives and livelihoods are being upended. Global security is at risk. Both urgent action and long-term thinking are needed in parallel. Urgent action is needed to stem the current crisis and prepare for the potential cyclical recurrence of COVID-19. And long-term thinking is required to mitigate the effects of this crisis on international peace and security, sustainable development, and humanitarian, and humanitarian affairs, and to prepare for future pandemics who undoubtedly will come. Today, we will be focusing uh, on the particular effect of COVID-19 and its effects on conflict dynamics and peacemaking worldwide. What is the risk that violent non-state actors will take this crisis as an opportunity to further foment extremism and armed conflict? What is the potential for increased instability as the pandemic disrupts humanitarian aid or exacerbates inequality and political division? How will the coronavirus present obstacles to the traditional tools used for the, for the maintenance of international peace and security, including UN peacekeeping, mediation, and peace building. These are questions to be addressed. We are very, very fortunate to have today uh, with us an absolutely excellent panel to discuss all this and beyond. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank particularly our partners for, for the event, the Antalya Diplomacy Forum, who has been our partners in this endeavor. Now, without further ado, I will give the floor to the Foreign Minister of Turkey, who is also the co-chair of the Friends of Mediation Group, both in the UN, in the OSCE, and in the OIC. Mevlid, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Rod Larsen, my dear colleagues, Fekka and Ignacio, Undersecretary Di Carlo, Commissioner Cergu, dear colleagues, and the participants from around the world. The pandemic has fast forwarded us in the digital age. Most of us uh, were already prepared. The theme of the Istanbul Mediation Conference in October, last October, the UN Group of Friends of Mediation Ministerial and Antalya Diplomacy Forum were all related to the uh, digital age. I announced Turkey's Digital Diplomacy Initiative uh, last year, last August, and we now see how relevant our uh, efforts uh, are. The ADF is a new initiative by Turkey to combine informed debate uh, with diplomatic uh, action. 
the pandemic uh, forced us to launch the forum on the digital platform. And today marks our uh, first uh, event. And we are very happy to partner with the IPI uh, for this uh, opening event. I had the pleasure to attend the IP events uh, during the uh, UNGA uh, in, in previous years. All participants uh, here are directly engaged in peacemaking. With Finland, we are co-chairs of the Friends of the Mediation Group at the United Nations. Civil Zealand join us in a similar group at the OSCE. The success of the initiative led uh, to the formation of a similar group within the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation. And the UN Group of Friends of Mediation now has 60 members. The group aims to keep mediation high on the agenda of the international uh, community. And this event is a part of an effort to remind us all that we need mediation. We need it more than ever now, as the world with the pandemic presents even more challenges. The pandemic has already complicated the existing efforts to find peaceful resolutions to conflicts. UN Security Council is in effect. Uh, months uh, have passed since the outbreak of the uh, pandemic and the Council has yet to come up uh, with the joint uh, resolution. And we see uh, escalation in uh, geopolitical uh, rivalries. Peacekeeping operations are affected. Troop rotations and deployments are frozen. Mediation and facilitation efforts are impaired. Um, as our focus is on the pandemic, the parties to various conflicts became more uh, blatant. In Libya, the purchase uh, warlord Haftar has increased his indiscriminate attacks against civilian particles in Tripoli. In Yemen and Syria, conflicts continue to claim life. Israeli government plans to annex parts of the West Bank. Terrorist organizations and extremist groups also perceive a window of opportunity. Recent reports on increased Daesh attacks in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan are alarming. The pandemic didn't stop the atrocities of the PKK uh, YPG. Far right groups circulate conspiracy theories and uh, stigmatize Muslims, refugees, Asians, and many other vulnerable groups, including IDPs, uh, refugees, and migrants, are affected uh, the most. The United Nations stressed that more than 90 billion US dollars is needed to control the pandemic and uh, protect 10% uh, of the world's uh, most uh, vulnerable. And in Italy, the interim government uh, had to introduce measures for 5 million people living in opposition controlled areas. They need immediate uh, support. The plight of Rohingya uh, continues unabated. Economic crisis could also spark new tensions. Uh, there is a, a severe decline in uh, employment. Uh, the World Food Program uh, warned of a possible uh, hunger pandemic. Uh, this is not something we can sit idly by and wait for uh, it uh, to happen. I'm not here today to draw, draw a very pessimistic uh, picture. But uh, these are the challenges that we are facing and we will be uh, facing in the future. So we must focus on the peaceful resolution of uh, conflicts and address the plight of vulnerable groups. We must ensure uninterrupted flow of humanitarian aid. We must also make international organizations relevant and credible again. We have seen the urgent need to reform the Security Council of the UN Security Council and uh, UN agencies. That said, this is not the time to further weaken uh, the existing mechanism. This is not the time to criticize them. This is the time to give, extend our uh, support as much as possible. Later on, we can sit and we can review uh, the situation. I mean, uh, how to reform them. And the pandemic is another reminder of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We should invest in them. Uh, we need to be creative in uh, using new di digital platforms. Uh, for instance, in Yemen, the UN is bringing the parties together over video conference uh, meetings. Uh, none of this can be successful unless we work 
uh, together. The pandemic has taught everyone a valuable lesson in globalization. What happens anywhere affects uh, everywhere. No country is safe until all countries are safe. We must keep multilateralism alive. The enemies of a rule-based global order will look for an opportunity to take unilateral steps. Multilateralism shouldn't be another casualty of uh, COVID-19. And it is not uh, strong rhetoric, but rather effective cooperation action, or cooperative action that will uh, save the day. So once again, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Foreign Minister, for your candid observations and perspectives. And particularly, I took note of uh, your call for more effective global action and joint action. So thank you once again. And I will now give the floor to the Foreign Minister of Finland, Pekka Harvestor. Uh, no, no, for me. Sorry? It's for me. Uh, is that you, Ismail? Yes. Oh. Uh, because uh, I'm, I'm leaving in a few minutes. My, my summit has started. Oh, it's not the speaking order I've been presenting with. But anyhow, uh, if Pekka would allow it, I would give the floor to you, uh, Ismail. You have the floor. Oh, then I'm, I'm leaving. I'm sorry. I'm going for my summit. Oh. It's off. I'm very sorry. Okay, then, uh, Pekka, we will go back to Finland. The Foreign Minister of Finland. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm here. here. Uh, I, was I was thinking that we had the commissioner, commissioner first. Yeah, but he it's, probably, it's probably my mistake, uh, and I apologize for it. Uh, okay. But anyhow, I think he has left the panel, so we cannot do anything. Okay. Sorry, sorry for, sorry for that. Okay. Um, first, uh, thank you, Terry. Uh huh. Okay, thank you, thank you, Terry, and thank you, Mevlut, for your opening words. Thank you for the organizers, IPI and uh, Antalaya Diplomacy Forum. Of course, uh, COVID-19 is first and foremost a health crisis, but with far-reaching implications on all spheres of life, and, and particularly it will have a very huge economic implications to our society. Pandemic poses a threat also for international peace and security. It can intensify existing conflicts, stall peace processes, and wake up old tensions. Even if current focus is in the health crisis, we must continue to focus on conflict prevention and promoting peace processes. It is disappointing that the Security Council has not been able to agree on a resolution addressing the threat of COVID pandemic to the international peace and security. I want to underline the importance of multilateralism and the rules-based international order. This must be in the core of our response to pandemic, too. The UN system and WHO need our strong political and financial support. I couldn't agree more with uh, Mevlut on this point. This is not the uh, time to shake the international institutions. Finland also has been contributing additional funding to WHO in these circumstances. I welcome the UN Secretary General's appeal for a global ceasefire. Proposal has gathered widespread support, but unfortunately, concrete results have remained rather minimal. According to one study by US NGO, only 10 of 43 conflict countries have responded to the UN call. In some countries, the situation has even deteriorated and fighting has escalated. In some countries, Cases like Sudan, the pandemic has complicated the transition process further. However, there are some positive exceptions. We can see reduction of violence in some countries at the local level, for example, in the Philippines. 
In Yemen, there are some encouraging signs, even if the situation remains volatile. It's important to support Yemen and its neighbors to continue the positive track, as well as Special Representative Griffith's work. Long-term implications for fragile states and conflict situations are yet to be seen. Existing inequalities between the countries and inside the societies are likely to deepen. On a positive note, the pandemic could provide opening for peace processes. This happened in history in Aceh, Aceh after the tsunami. Working together over conflict lines to fight pandemic may build confidence between the parties and promote dialogue. Important that the international community stands ready to support swiftly the positive openings in conflict regions that the pandemics may bring. In some political transitions, the international community is considering some form of peace dividend to welcome political settlement, for example, by debt rescheduling. This is the case, for example, regarding Somalia. At the same time, for example, in Africa, economic integration is increasing. Combining these trends might support the regional stabilization. Then I want to finish with two remarks, uh, or two, three remarks. First, on, on human rights. Uh, when there has been a full lockdown in some societies, it, it, it looks that some countries are using these to putting too harsh uh, conditions to the, and restrictions to the population and, and challenging democratic values. My other points are the vulnerable groups, I'm thinking particularly uh, women and girls, marginalized groups in societies that might be under extra stress in this uh, COVID-19 uh, conditions. And we know from many peace processes how crucial the role of the women, youth, uh, girls are in peace processes. And then my final remarks is about first about the disinformation. Of course, this uh, COVID-19 situation gives a huge opportunity also for all kinds of disinformation. That's the negative side. Positive side of the new technologies, of course, is that we can use the new technologies also in, as a peace building tool, and we can engage particularly the young people and youth through social media and, and new technologies, digitalization. So we will see some kind of digitalization of the peace processes as well. Thank you. I heard a strong appeal for global action through multilateral organizations. Uh, and of course, uh, as is well known, you, you are also the co-chair of the Friends of Mediation Group in the UN and in the OEC uh, in Vienna. Um, so uh, thank you again. And I'm now moving to the uh, head of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland, Ignacio Cassis, who is the co-chair of Mediation Group of the Mediation Group in the OEC. Thank you, Mr. Rod Larsen, dear colleagues, Mevlut and Pekka, dear Under Secretary General, and dear Commissioner for Peace and Security, if already <laughs> uh, disappeared from uh, the conference. Um, thank you, especially you, Mevlut, and the ADF for the organization of this panel. I hope uh, you are well, and I'm glad to join you for this discussion. The COVID-19 pandemic has tremendously affected our societies in the last weeks. I want to express my sympathies to you and all your countries for the loss of life and severe economic damages. Switzerland is now gradually reducing the confinement and reopening schools, trade, and restaurants. But the economic effects of the lockdown are huge. At time, one out of three employee employees are under partial unemployment benefit scheme. We are entering a new normality with many, many questions. The capacities of our health system and our economy were heavily tested. We had to put measures in place that are truly exceptional for a democracy like ours. Our parliament is uh, now meeting again, re-establishing the necessary democratic check, checks and balances. In contexts that are prone to violent conflict, the current pandemic poses fundamental challenges of humanitarian, economical, and political nature. How can democratic systems protect themselves from abuse Pekka has already mentioned about that. 
how can we ensure that exceptional and temporary extensions of executive powers remain short term? How can those who voice criticism be protected in the right to do so? How can those who depend on outside scrutiny for protection still be guaranteed safety despite the closure of borders, emergency measures, and a, massi and a massive presence of security forces? The call for a global ceasefire by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres provides an answer. Its message is quite simple. Instead of continuing fighting, let us work together in overcoming the crisis. The initial response from conflict parties in many different contexts has been positive. Switzerland, together with Canada, was instrumental to mobilize 60 UN member states to express support for the call. My country, has also been active over the past months in promoting the UN call in contexts as diverse as Cameroon and Colombia. In Cameroon, as part of our commitment to peace, we work to promote social cohesion during the pandemic in order for communities to cope better, better with the challenges presented by both the conflict and the pandemic. In every crisis, there is also an opportunity. This is why my ministry has come up with a rapid response mechanism to stimulate peace, rule of law, and human rights during the, during the pandemic. To date, 21 projects have been funded to jumpstart innovative activities. For example, we are supporting initiatives that contribute to safeguarding democratic standards in the crisis, through fostering dialogue by means of digital technology among leaders and experts. Indeed, innovation is a key in adapting to the challenges of the COVID crisis. Digital technology help us to uh, digital technology help us keep up the contact with and among conflict parties in peace processes. They also give us the means to monitor events. These technical tools and experiences may be of help beyond this crisis. But peace will never come about virtually. It will always require, require the physical presence and the trust of very real women and men. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, for Switzerland and our long-standing tradition of offering good offices to conflict parties, one essential element, uh, element has not changed with the crisis. More than ever, we stand ready to support dialogue efforts and peace negotiations and to mediate where we are invited to do so. Mediation is about trust. It is about patience. It is also about preparing the ground for the future, for future negotiations. This is what allows the conflict parties to start working towards a peaceful settlement of their conflict. All hands on deck. That is going to be the call for us all. The expertise, the expertise support and resources from all countries will be needed to revive stalled peace process after the crisis. We will continue our work for peace and even strengthen it further. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ignacio, and also for that very powerful uh, appeal you gave. And again, what we heard is a very holistic approach, not looking only at the um, uh, narrow uh, health issues, uh, which are so burning across the globe, but also at multiple social, political, and economic, and particularly mediation effects of the pandemic. So uh, with this call for, um, with these, all these calls for more effective multilateralism, uh, as I detect from all the interventions so far, for you, Rosemary, that must be music in your ears. So Rosemary Di Carlo is of course Under Secretary General of the UN Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, and Rosemary, you now have the floor.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. Uh, I'm very pleased to join you and honorable ministers today, and I'm grateful uh, to Turkey for organizing today's event under the auspices of IPI. As other speakers have said, though the COVID-19 pandemic is foremost a health crisis, it has wide-ranging dimensions, and it risks hitting conflict settings especially hard. This is a time for vigilance. As the Secretary General recently informed the Security Council, the pandemic also poses a significant threat to international peace and security. He outlined a number of risks that are particularly pressing, including a further erosion of trust in public institutions if citizens perceive that authorities mishandle the response, an economic fallout that could create greater stressors, potentially leading to civil unrest, postponement of elections or the holding of a vote with or without adequate mitigation measures leading to a crisis of legitimacy, conflict actors exploiting the situation to press their advantage, increased terrorist activity, and restrictions of movement making conflict prevention and resolution more difficult. All of this happening at a time when mediation efforts are needed now more than ever. The challenge for peacemakers and peacemaking at this time is great. On 23 March, uh, the Secretary General appealed for a global ceasefire to stop the fighting, facilitate the delivery of humanitarian assistance, and open space for diplomatic engagement. He made his appeal in recognition of the fact that as conflicts rage, COVID-19 will further complicate our efforts to resolve them. Now, others have mentioned that the initial response was impressive and support has come from every corner of the world and includes member states, regional partners, civil society, and prominent religious leaders. And combatants from Colombia and Cameroon to the Philippines and parts of the Middle East supported the appeal and took tentative steps to stop fighting. However, these initial gestures of support are not translating into concrete change on the ground. Regrettably, the guns are yet to be silenced. The situation in the Sahel has deteriorated following increased attacks, and extremist groups have disregarded the call and instead urged their followers to take advantage of COVID-19, including by spreading disinformation. In Libya, where the parties have called for humanitarian truces at various times in the past, the fighting has increased. The conflict has not stopped in Syria or Afghanistan. Last week's despicable attack on a maternity hospital in Kabul left 24 people dead and another 16 wounded, including women and newborn babies. Meanwhile, in Yemen, despite the announcement of a temporary unilateral ceasefire by Saudi Arabia on behalf of the coalition, the violence persists. Nevertheless, the ceasefire call has refocused attention on the suffering caused by armed conflict and the urgency to end fighting in order to face a new global common threat. And we must continue to apply pressure on conflict parties to stop fighting. Such pressure must also come from those supporting the conflict parties, politically or with weapons. A ceasefire can lead to discussions on lasting political solutions. While the pandemic has affected the practice of diplomacy and mediation itself, our envoys and missions have increased efforts to reignite political processes around the world, often through the use of digital tools and platforms to engage with conflict parties as well as other stakeholders, even in the context of ongoing fighting. In Libya, for example, the working groups established in Berlin have met remotely. In Yemen, as others have mentioned, special envoys making a concerted effort to expand the space for political talks through remote and in-person dialogue. And in Afghanistan, the government and the Taliban engaged through virtual means last month on prisoner releases, though talks have yet since stalled. Although we all recognize the limitations of dialogues, the increased use of technology has the potential to create and enhance the inclusivity of peace processes, including the participation of women and young people. Now, the path ahead is not easy. Nobody said it would be. To succeed, the international community will have to come together decisively and help translate early gains now fading into lasting peace. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam and the Secretary General. Thank you also for participating at the Istanbul Mediation Conference last year with Secretary General Guterres. I think despite one glitch, we've had a very good start with our distinguished speakers. We're hoping to get, of course, Commissioner Chargui at some uh, another event. Uh, the speakers have walked us through the nexus of conflict, peace, safety, and development during and after the coronavirus outbreak. Pandemics have shaped the history, the course of history in several instances throughout the history. Uh, in some cases, natural disasters or common challenges paved the way towards peace. And one such example that I remember was a 2004 tsunami in the Asia Pacific. It helped initiate the peace process that eventually ended a decades long conflict in Aceh. It really depends on what we as international community do at critical junctures. And I think all the speakers have un underlined this point. As Minister Cevuchol wrote recently, what we do today will define tomorrow. I think we're all set to go further. Uh, I now invite the IPI president back to take us through the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much both to you, Rosemary, and to you, uh, Burak. And we are now some time left uh, for the Q&A uh, section. And we have actually received a number of questions already from around the world. And let me start with uh, Priyal Singh, who is a researcher at the Institute for Security Studies, IWS in South Africa. Uh, the questions are uh, from uh, Singh um, as follows. What are some of the main peace and security contexts that have been currently affected by the pandemic? Next question, are there any key lessons that can already be identified and incorporated into a global set of best practices. I think uh, I will go back to the Foreign Minister of Turkey to first address this question, and then we can uh, go around uh, to all the other panelists. You have oh, thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, our friends who put the question from uh, South Africa, uh, Mr. Uh, Priyal uh, Singh. The pandemic is uh, more than a health uh, crisis. It has a global social, economic, political, and uh, security uh, implications. The erosion of the trust in public institutions, economic fallout in fragile countries, uh, stalled uh, peace processes, uh, loss of credibility of international organizations, and deliberate attempts uh, to erode multilateralism. We emphasize the importance of effective multilateralism today as well. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, terrorist groups and extremists are seeking uh, ways to abuse this crisis. Daesh and Al-Qaeda celebrate the impact uh, of the pandemic on the West. Boko Haram considers uh, it, uh, the, I mean, the pandemic as a plot against Muslims. Far-right groups are uh, circulating various conspiracy theories. So when it comes to a key lessons or two key lessons. First of all, uh, the outbreak doesn't recognize any boundaries, social classes, ethnicities, or religions. Combating the pandemic has reminded us uh, you know, of the need for solidarity to tackle COVID-19 uh, related uh, hate, xenophobia, uh, and also uh, scapegoating uh, as well. And uh, we also took the lesson that uh, only if we join our efforts, we can overcome this uh, pandemic. And as Turkey, we do our best to support uh, the other countries uh, that in need of uh, medical uh, equipment. We have already uh, provided medical equipment to 82 countries out of uh, 135 requested uh, such kind of medical uh, equipment from Turkey. So international cooperation, solidarity, and effective multilateralism is the best guarantor to maintain our security and stability. Therefore, uh, during this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, as Turkey, we increase our efforts uh, regionally and globally. G20, OIC ministerial, uh, MIGTA initiatives, and Turkey Council uh, meetings and uh, other uh, meetings that I'm going to have another video conference together with uh, our colleagues from uh, Germany, uh, UK, and France after this uh, meeting. 
And I had another meeting recently with uh, our uh, friends, colleagues from neighboring countries to trilaterally, quadrilaterally. So uh, we need uh, the solidarity and cooperation more than ever now. And we should also take full advantage of the uh, UN's and other international organizations, toolboxes, and mediation is uh, just one of these uh, tools. And as, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, we can criticize the uh, international organizations, but uh, because they are uh, far from perfect, but this is not the time to criticize them. And But we should take also lesson uh, from this pandemic that these, uh, these regional and international organizations are not capable to meet at the, the needs of our societies uh, today or expectations of our society, societies today or uh, is not capable to face the challenges that we are all together facing today. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Margaret, um, once again. Um, we will now move to Finland and take a, you have the floor in order to address the question from uh, Priya Singh from South Africa. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for Priyal Singh for a very good question. And, and first, I couldn't agree more with uh, my good friend Mevlut on, 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 on the multilateralism and the approach you have to international organizations. We certainly have to renew them and, and, and there is room for criticism. But during the crisis, I think it's very important that we support the UN system and multilateral organizations, including WHO, for developing the vaccination, developing the health response for, for COVID-19 and, and having having the response uh, as a global response. And there is where we particularly need the UN agencies. On uh, peace processes and what kind of uh, implications this situation can have, maybe a couple of remarks. One, of course, is this closure of, of societies due to the lockdown, I, I'm thinking now I can mention North Korea, for example, that, that very little information and contacts are happening now during during the COVID-19 period for obvious reasons. So if the, the COVID-19 can, can slow down some of the processes. Then a very important issue that was also taken up by the Turkish foreign minister is, is that this is a perfect uh, moment for xenophobia or hate speech or, or marginalizing groups. And, and we have seen the, the language used against Rohingya or in some countries against the Muslim minorities, accusing some minority for, for spreading the disease and, and so forth. Very nasty games ongoing. And unfortunately, we see photos where, where fighters are having their machine guns and their, uh, their face masks at the same time. So they, let, let us take Libya, for example, people just continue the fighting, maybe trying to protect themselves for the spread of the virus, but, but uh, uh, nothing, nothing else is, is uh, happening or, or changing. So it's very important, of course, that we, even in these uh, circumstances, keep the existing peace processes on, on track and also use the new technologies and new approaches to, to uh, reaching out uh, new groups and, and, and uh, start even starting new peace processes. I'm, I'm very much in favor, of course, when coming from Finland on this digital uh, peace mediation and all what technology can, can create. But of course, I, 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 I also want to remind myself that, for example, when visiting the Central African Republic, people mentioned that only 10 percent have access to electricity. So there are countries where 90 percent of people are, are out of reach. Uh, they don't have mobile phones, they, they don't have computers, so it's good to, good to remember that there are also parts of the world where the digi digital divide still exists very deep and also it's influencing the peace processes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pekka. I will now uh, move to uh, Switzerland. Ignacio, you have the floor to address uh, the questions. Ignacio? So now you hear me? I can hear you now. Hello? You, you, uh, wonderful. Thank you, Terry. And thank you to Minister uh, Priya Singh uh, for these questions. Uh, well, uh, of course, no context uh, remains unaffected. The uh, actual magnitude uh, of COVID-19 on ongoing this process will only be assessed truly once uh, we can work again directly with our counterparts. So for now, I can 
we, we, we are observing some, some context, like in Afghanistan, uh, where we witness an increase in violence, for instance, or in Colombia, with a unilateral COVID-related ceasefire who was not renewed. Uh, while in the Philippines, both government and the new People's Army continue with their uh, ceasefire. In some context, uh, elections are postponed, I'm thinking about Ethiopia, or are maintained despite the effects uh, of the ongoing pandemic. I'm thinking about Burundi, which I guess will vote tomorrow, is elect tomorrow. Both phenomena present risks and uh, opportunities, of course. And uh, these are just few examples. As I see it, at this present moment, there will be need to rebuild trust among the conflict parties once this pandemic has passed over. And this uh, trust uh, is not just given for itself. We have to build it together. And uh, I guess uh, the uh, multilateral efforts which uh, we can emphasize during the crisis and after the crisis must be huge uh, despite all criticism to uh, UN and UN agencies uh, uh, because during the crisis we have to uh, work together to uh, overcome uh, uh, the crisis and to, need the, uh, uh, the, to, uh, to meet the needs uh, of the people. Thank you very much. And then um, I will go to uh, Rosemary again. Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. I mentioned a few uh, contexts uh, in my statement uh, that have been affected, but let me elaborate a little bit further. Um, I do think Libya is a case in point where we now have parties really pushing their advantage. We saw twice in the month, uh, in this last month, that bombs have hit a hospital in Tripoli, for example, that was designated as a site for COVID-19 patients. Uh, in Somalia, Al-Shabaab has increased its activities. Uh, and, you know, exponentially in the last few months. Um, 27 elections have thus far been postponed this year. There will be more, I am sure. Um, we heard about uh, Burundi, for example, but also there are tensions in Bolivia because of a postponed election. Uh, we advise countries to have a consensus decision of all parties when it comes to whether an election should be conducted or postponed. And we are advising them in mitigation measures as well. Uh, protests. Uh, we saw protests in Lebanon a few months ago, but they've been renewed because of COVID-19. This time, the focus is somewhat different. Uh, before, it was about sectarian politics. It was about the economy. But now it's about hunger because of food insecurity. So we have some very serious problems and uh, where COVID is really exacerbating existing tensions. As far as lessons learned, I think we need to be very careful of how we set our priorities, and we do need data-driven approaches. For example, there are oil-producing countries that are going to be hit probably even more by uh, COVID-19, uh, and will need our attention both in terms of economic support, but also in terms of political engagement. Uh, we have to be careful and monitor uh, excessive use of force and lockdowns. We've seen this happening. Uh, hate speech. Uh, and sexual and domestic gender-based violence. Very important issue now. We see more and more women and children um, who are suffering. I think also, as far as another lesson learned, I think we now understand we need to be much better at developing partnerships with local mediators, individuals on the ground, who can be working mediation activities in person while we are doing it remotely. Thank you. Um, I can see we have about half an hour left of uh, the time to our disposal, uh, and I've been requested to be very strict uh, on the time limits there. So I will combine uh, two questions which we have received. The first one is from Walid Al Harari. He's with the Sana Center for Strategic Studies in uh, in Yemen, and uh, the second one is from Priska Maniala who is the president of the National Student Association in the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, I will go to um, uh, Walid Al Harari first. Uh, and there's a backdrop uh, to uh, his question. And the backdrop is as follows. Last month, the UN Special Envoy to Yemen told the Security, uh, told the Security Council that he would seek to convene video conference meetings 
between the main warring parties in Yemen. Moving meetings online, while unavoidable now, uh, unavoidable due to COVID-19, represents a shift away from the local and customary mediation approaches, as well as away from the envoy's own strategy centered on personal interaction with stakeholders in Sana and Riyadh. And uh, the question goes like this. What challenges are presented by shifting mediation to an online platform and what impact would such a shift have on the art and on the craft of mediation processes? Uh, the second question which I uh, will refer to you um, is um, uh, from uh, BRC. Uh, and Priscilla uh, Mandiaya, uh, she remarks, in a conflict like the, the DRC where humanitarian needs have to be met, the disruption of key humanitarian and development programs have serious consequences in remote areas affected by conflict. Then comes the question, what are best practices for ensuring that the needs of IDPs, refugees, returnees and migrants are integrated into the COVID-19 responses. These are the two sets of questions. And uh, uh, Nabit, I will go to Turkey first again. Can you please uh, uh, address the questions and share uh, your perspectives? Thank, thank you very much. First, uh, on the question on Yemen. In Yemen, no uh, parties on the ground have military superiority. Uh, that's why the war has been there uh, that's another reason that the war has been there for many years. In the absence of our constructive involvement of the international community, uh, the war may drag, for, uh, drag on for many other uh, years. Another source of concern is the resurgence of separatist movements in the South, supported by uh, one of the countries uh, in the region, I mean the UAA. Uh, all these are against uh, the background of major uh, pandemic and first, uh, uh, first of all, all parties should respect the call of the United Nations Secretary General for the cessation of the uh, hostilities. As, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, the, despite all these efforts, uh, the war still uh, continues. Online mediation or similar uh, interactions could of course be used under the current circumstances and building and maintaining trust in online mediation will be uh, more challenging. The human factor is very important in mediation efforts. This is what we ha have experienced and this is uh, why most of the time the parties uh, to a conflict are brought together in an uh, insulated uh, setting. In online mediation efforts, parties might be more open to peer pressure when they are not in an isolated environment. It might also be more difficult to come up with creative on the spot solution. Nevertheless, uh, we cannot put on hold uh, on all mediation efforts because of the pandemic. And there can also be uh, pros of offline mediation. Uh, it could prevent a heated debate that might <laughs> result in uh, one side uh, leaving the uh, table. In any case, digital diplomacy uh, is our best uh, chance uh, under uh, these conditions. With regards to second question on migrants and uh, refugees, uh, refugees and displaced persons are among the most vulnerable groups affected by the pandemic, as I stressed in my opening remarks. Most countries are focused on their national responses. However, uh, refugees shouldn't be left to themselves. Uh, some concrete recommendations based on our best practices. All COVID-19 healthcare measures at the national level should be taken for refugees as well. There should be no distinctions. Measures for new arrivals are important as well. Quarantine regulations should be carefully uh, implemented for refugees, migrants and IDPs. Their conditions should be monitored uh, regularly. Detention centers, reception centers and refugee camps should be uh, regularly disinfected. And temporary housing for asylum seekers and uh, refugees uh, should be uh, provided. As the largest refugee hosting country in the world, we always stress that helping refugees is not just the responsibility of the host countries, 
fighting the pandemic is no exception. And 80% of the refugees live in the developing or less developed countries. It means that those countries should be supported uh, now and uh, international community uh, should be more vigilant. And UN's global humanitarian response plans include uh, these uh, refugee responses to the most affected or potentially affected countries. And we hope uh, that a plan gets the support um, it deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will then go to Switzerland, Ignacio. Thanks a lot. Uh, I will start with the uh, Yemen question, number two. Uh, concerning online and digitalization, online platforms and digitalization. We very much, first of all, let me say that we very much support the endeavor of uh, the endeavors of uh, the special envoy of the UN Secretary General to help bring peace to Yemen. The use of uh, online tools in peace processes may present opportunities, especially when nobody can travel for meetings in person. Such tools help maintaining contact. These tools are sometimes perceived uh, as impersonal or, no, or, or not discretionary enough. Therefore, they might not always be the best option. I'm firmly convinced that for negotiation to be successful, the environment and the atmosphere are as important as the possibility to speak to uh, each other formally. This is important because it helps building trust it is often small side meetings or just an informal chat in the margin of a formal meetings that allows for progress to happen. This is what digital tools do not offer despite their chat rooms or lobbies. Let us nevertheless remain open-minded and particularly in these times, make the best use of the digital opportunities in building peace. I come over now to the next question from DRC concerning the uh, um, migrants and displaced persons. Uh, the first thing I want to recall is that uh, we don't, uh, we shouldn't forget that migrants and displaced persons face serious needs and vulnerabilities prior to the COVID pandemic. This crisis has uh, now exas exacerbated these needs and vulnerabilities. Among the main prerequisites to ensure that migrants, displaced persons, and their host communities are integrated in the COVID responses is sustained and unimpended humanitarian access. You know, the question of humanitarian ac access is always central, a central question. It is also important that the humanitarian assistance and protections are delivered in an impartial manner based on need alone, not to instrumentalize it for any other reasons. This ensures that the forbidden displaced are not excluded from the assistance and protection. Then we must not forget that most migrants and displaced persons are not located in camps but in informal settlements or in slums of large cities. Humanitarian and development action must include them and their host communities into their response. And finally, it is of vital importance, humanitarian and development actors coordinate their, their response, uh, that their interventions are part of one overarching plan with collective outcomes. This is the only way to ensure that the assistance is delivered in the most efficient and relevant way. We unfortunately assist somewhere in the world, in some place, that no coordination affects the people uh, even more than uh, no help at all. So uh, we have to really pay attention to the question of coordination and uh, uh, to work together. Thank you. Uh, we will then quickly move to uh, Pekka of Finland. Uh, and I will ask Pekka to address this question. I can see we, are, we have now about 20 minutes left. So may I make an appeal that uh, all for there are two more questions, which I will uh, ask you to, to address that we put everything in nutshells when we speak. Pekka, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Terry. And, and very shortly, first, if you think what is the biggest enemy of uh, digital diplomacy, of course, is the bad lines. You know, when talking to Horn of Africa or, or falling to Somalia or to Sudan or recently to Eritrea, the, the lines are not perfect. And of course, this might prevent a little bit the di digital diplomacy, but uh, it's important that we use all those technologies that are available. I think regarding Yemen and Valed al Hariri's question, of course, Yemen is one of those countries where, where there has been a positive response uh, by, by, by countries involved to appeal of Secretary General, and this is, of course, a, a very good good sign, but, but uh, I, I think the, the question is right in that, that you, when you want to advance this kind of grassroots diplomacy and, and, and talk to talk to lo local level and so forth, of course, it's very difficult to start from the zero uh, with the digital means. It's, it's easier when you already know the, the people. Then to Priska Mania's uh, question, and I, I think uh, Madame Di Carlo already touched in a very good way the vulnerable groups and the women and the domestic violence issues and all, all these, and of course, during this kind of crisis, this violence might increase and, and, and vulnerable uh, groups are even more vulnerable, in, including uh, refugees. Uh, we, for example, in Finland made this spring a decision to take 175 children, unaccompanied children, as re refugee children to, to Finland. And of course, it raises also here domestically a big debate, you know, how do we prevent the COVID-19 if some of the children have it and, and so forth and so forth. So people are more concerned, even those recipient countries who are taking refugees, what is the health situation and how this will uh, affect the health. So this, these kind of uh, additional concerns there, of course, are. But, but at the moment, it's very important that we keep the borders open. We, we let the aid workers to work. We, we let the equipment to go also to the refugee camps. And, and of course, the water, sanitation, uh, awareness, testing capacity, protective equipment, all, all this is still crucial. And I just want to mention that when, when dealing with uh, African countries, of course, many of them remind us that they have a huge experience of the Ebola crisis, for example, that how to fight against the Ebola, maybe even better experience than what, what we have in Europe on, on fighting very, very dangerous diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Rose, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as regards to Yemen and uh, remote mediation, um, obviously, uh, as others have said, mediation is a human-centric activity and face-to-face -face meetings are far better. Uh, it's extremely difficult to pick up on nonverbal cues in virtual meetings. Uh, there's no ability to explore informal moments. There's no card or diplomacy. Um, security and confidentiality on online platforms also are a concern, particularly to many of the parties engaged. Um, access or degree of familiarity with digital technologies also varies greatly. Uh, that said, it is the only method we have at this point, and we must use it and learn uh, to adapt some of the techniques that mediators have used in the past in virtual meetings. Um, obviously, when it comes to Yemen, uh, Martin Griffiths has his daily in contact virtually uh, with people on the ground in Yemen. Uh, he's, in he's in contact, contact with, with countries that have influence on the parties. Uh, he, he has done some traveling, traveling but, but it's very difficult. difficult. Uh, as, as far as, as the most vulnerable, vulnerable refugees, refugees, IDPs, IDPs migrants, etc., et just want to assure you that every country that has a UN country team, has humanitarian workers from the United Nations, has developed a plan in response to COVID-19. Whether it's contingency or an actual plan, they're implementing at this point. And vulnerable populations are very much in the forefront of their efforts. Uh, UNHCR, for example, has strengthened its efforts to implement uh, COVID-19 prevention and response uh, in refugee camps and displacement sites. And this is happening with a number of agencies working in humanitarian uh, assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, we have now 15 minutes left uh, to our disposal. Uh, I'll take the risk of asking and combining two questions again. The first is from uh, Pravina Makan Laka, which is a member of Femboys Africa, the network of African women in conflict prevention and mediation in South Africa. She observes the, corona, the coronavirus outbreak will lead to an amplification of existing inequalities and conflict fault lines. Women will be disproportionately affected. Uh, is there a risk? 
that uh, that we will witness a retreat in women's participation in mediation because of the change in conflict dynamics brought about by the virus. What strategies are needed to mitigate this looming risk? Then the last question is from uh, Aisha Kuran. She's a student at Kabul University and former uh, Afghan youth representative to, to the United Nations uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, she uh, observes, a lack of trust is growing on both sides in Afghanistan. Recent attacks to put the future of the intra-Afghan peace negotiations at risk. The global health crisis does not recognize political boundaries uh, uh, and it presents obstacles to any in-person negotiations. How will the warring parties manage to hold intra-Afghan talks considering uh, these additional challenges created by COVID-19? Uh, again, I will start with Turkey, but let you have the floor. And again, I will give to everybody, be brief and to the point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we all agree that participation of women in peace process is key. And this force of inclusion and uh, ownership. Uh, actually, statistics also prove that their presence at the negotiation table yield durable results. Women's participation increases to probability of a peace agreement lasting at, uh, at least uh, two years by 20%. And the probability of a peace agreement lasting uh, 15 years uh, by uh, 35 percent. It means uh, we achieve a lot over uh, last 20 years. However, there is still room for further uh, improvement regarding uh, women's participation in uh, peace uh, processes. The outbreak will probably act as a conflict and. Uh, inequality multiplier, uh, it will also impact women and girls uh, disproportionately as highlighted by the Secretary uh, General report on the impact of COVID-19 on uh, women. With regards to a uh, question on Afghanistan, I would like to thank Sister Aisha for uh, this uh, question. Afghanistan has uh, suffered from an armed conflict for more than 40 years and the time for peace has come in this country. There are promising steps, uh, reduction of violence in February, uh, agreement in Doha, uh, I also participated, and prisoner exchange between the government and the Taliban. However, violence remains high and the prospects for a peace agreement are getting dimmer. Uh, we urge all uh, parties to end the violence uh, and focus on the very uh, interests of uh, the Afghan people, especially against the uh, background of the uh, pandemic. And uh, we are happy, we welcome and support the, uh, the reconciliation uh, between all these actors to form the uh, inclusive and uh, inclusive uh, and better representative uh, government. I just spoke on the phone with Dr. Abdullah uh, and uh, also uh, uh, General uh, Marshal uh, Dostum, and I will speak to Acting Foreign Minister immediately after this uh, conference webinar. And as Turkey, we will continue, of course, uh, supporting uh, this country. Uh, but as I underline at, at every NATO uh, meeting, uh, we should stay in Afghanistan as long as uh, they need us and uh, uh, until the lasting uh, peace and stability is ensured uh, in the uh, country. And we have uh, many mechanisms uh, to support Afghanistan. And we have also one initiative, uh, Turkey, Afghanistan, Pakistan, trilateral mechanism. We agreed to convene the ministerial uh, meeting and the summit uh, when the pandemic is over. And Turkey is going to host uh, the Heart of Asia Istanbul process uh, summit that we had to postpone because of the election in the country. So regional ownership is also very uh, crucial for the stability of uh, uh, the country. 
and uh, we will continue uh, standing by uh, Afghan uh, people in the future as well. They really deserve uh, peace and uh, prosperity. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, thank you, and thank you, first, Ravina Makan Lakha, for a good question. Uh, I, I started by, by mentioning the, the women mediators. Finland has been supporting this network of the female mediators, and, and we need more women in the peace process, also on the mediator side. There are many cultures, many situations where women can talk to women easier than to, to men. And we need, of course, women to participate in the peace processes. And, and one uh, way of doing it, of course, is that we should increase the support of local women organizations. I have been working with some women organizations in Somalia and so forth, and they have been doing remarkable work during the war conditions. And of course, with the new technologies, we hope that young people, women, could participate better in these processes, but of course the risk of marginalization is there. And also in the COVID-19 situation, it is possible that women have to carry duties for their families and so forth and do not have time for, for, for these processes. And then to the Aisha Kuram's uh, question on, on, on Afghan, Afghanistan. First, I would like to mention that Finland is co-hosting with the UN uh, in coming November uh, Afghanistan pledging conference. We think that this is a very crucial for also for the political process, uh, the, the conference will be in, in November in, in, in Geneva. And of course, we, how we see Afghanistan situation that we stress all the time to inclusivity. Inclusivity, of course, of all the fighting parties, but also the inclusiveness regarding the civil society of the Afghan, Afghanistan process and, and including women and, and youth. Without this inclusivity, the Afghan process will not fly. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pekka, and then Ignacio Switzerland. Thank you. Regarding the first question of uh, Pravina Makanlaka from South Africa, I really have uh, nothing to add uh, to uh, that. Uh, what Pekka has already said, I join uh, his uh, comments and his statement, as well as the ones, the comments of uh, Madame Di Carlo. Uh, she had. Uh, she commented before uh, uh, the question of uh, women and their involvement in these processes. I'll uh, to speed up uh, the uh, uh, answer, I come to the next one, Aisha Kurman from uh, Kabul University concerning Afghanistan. And of course, I have already said in my opening remarks that uh, the recent uh, renewed violence in Afghanistan is very disturbing and we call upon all sides to stop this violence. Indeed, the uh, ongoing violence not only makes a uh, much needed effected response to the pandemic more difficult, it also puts at risk the rapid commencement uh, of the intra-Afghan peace talks. These negotiations uh, should be a promise for all Afghans to design their future in peace. They need uh, to be designed well and they need to have a solid basis so that all those engaging in these talks uh, know what it is they, what it is they can expect from them. From such an understanding, trust develops, and I've already the importance. I've already mentioned the importance of trust before. Let me be clear: the political will to engage in negotiations on all sides if it is strong enough, will overcome the hardest of the uh, COVID pandemic. Switzerland stands ready, I've already in, uh, said in my introducing remarks, uh, to support reflections about the negotiation design for the intra-Afghan negotiations where the parties, uh, <coughs> where are the parties to call for such support. Thank you. Rosemary. Thank, Thank you. First, let me just say that women are indeed disproportionately affected by the virus and they should therefore be involved in any pandemic response plans not just in mediation efforts i think this is really important now to say uh, second when it comes to mediation it is absolutely clear that women must be engaged and we've been trying very hard to engage women and are intensifying their efforts in this anniversary year of resolution 1325 20th anniversary our envoys for Syria and Yemen have been engaging women before the pandemic and now through remote means. It's a way of bringing more people into peace processes, getting their voices heard, understanding their concerns. 
a special representative in Colombia doing the same uh, in the implementation of the peace plan in Colombia and has a, a wide circle of women that he deals with virtually at this point uh, in that regard. I think it's extremely important that we champion uh, the need to have women involved in mediation processes and peace processes. Uh, there is a concern uh, that funding will go down, will decrease, but there's also a major concern that funding will decrease for conflict prevention during this period, given the other humanitarian and economic needs. And I don't think we should uh, ignore uh, dealing with conflict prevention at this critical period. As far as Afghanistan is concerned, I do think that the meeting, the virtual meeting held by the Afghan government and the Taliban was uh, a good step forward as a way of dialogue. They obviously then met in person. It's gonna be extremely difficult, obviously, to bring as many people together as they would like during this period. There are virtual means, certainly not ideal, but when I was in Afghanistan last year, it was very clear to me that Afghans want peace from all segments of society. And I think that we must support them and do whatever we can uh, in order to bring about greater dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rosemary. What is left for me now, we have four minutes left, is uh, simply to um, thank you all. And particularly, I would like to say that we are very grateful to the Foreign Minister of Turkey and Foreign Minister of Finland who initiated this uh, session. Um, I think all interventions we've heard from, from the panelists have been very candid uh, and um, very, I would say, in addition, very passionate about finding solutions to the broad set of issues which the pandemic crisis are facing us with. Uh, and I'm taking careful note of the holistic approach which everybody uh, has um, tuned into and um, also the unanimous call for multilateral action and to support the relevant multilateral institutions and where of course the UN is at the heart of it. So my gratefulness to all of you uh, I think we've been excellent panelists, um, and um, it was very well done. Uh, so all that is left for me then is to say uh, thank you once again. Uh, wish you a good day, a good evening, a good afternoon, or whatever it is where you are, and wish you good luck in your important work uh, in this particular field. Now I will give the floor to Burak Akhapar uh, for final remarks. Burak, you have the floor. Burak is the Director General for Foreign Policy Analysis and Coordination. In the Foreign Ministry of Thank you, Terry, and thank you, Excellencies, for this wonderful, wonderful session. I think we've had a great discussion with lots of valuable insights, and I think very key takeaways for our future peace agenda. At times like these, the role and contribution of focal uh, groups like the UN, OSC, and OIC Group of Friends of Mediation matter more than ever. Uh, if there is one, one time-honored message of these groups, it is that one can never give up searching for peace, and peace has to be sought collaboratively. Uh, the Antalya Diplomacy Forum will also be relentless in the search for peace and development and thinking about uh, the, uh, how to make it happen. Uh, Excellence is your work to raise awareness on mediation and promote peaceful resolution of conflicts is most commendable. Thank you very much. Uh, the audience, wonderful audience we've had for tuning in. Thank you for the excellent questions. Many greetings from the Antalya Diplomacy Forum, our valuable partner, International Peace Institute. Uh, our activities will continue. Uh, I'm hoping to see you all in Antalya. Until then, stay well and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Excellencies. Really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day.